So again, good evening, everybody. Tonight's study is a continuation of the studies that we've been doing in the book of Daniel and now in here in Revelation. Tonight's study is titled, Time is Running Out. So focus on Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Revelation chapter 17 and 18. And this is lesson 18 in our study series uh, where we have gone through the word of God and we've gotten to the point where we are getting to the point of where God has given us the warning messages. God has told us who is going to be faithful. God has given us the characteristics of those who will be able to stand in the time of trouble, in the time of the mark of the beast. And then now we're getting to the point where we see where Babylon, that mystery Babylon that we're going to read about tonight, how this, this mystery Babylon, this symbol of a corrupt church, how we'll receive its just rewards in the, the last plagues upon the earth. And so as we get into the study, we just want to recap Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13 and 14, we were introduced to this mark of the beast crisis where we saw this beast come from the sea. This beast with the seven heads and ten horns coming up out of the sea, having the mouth of a lion, the body of a bear, I mean, the, the balls of a bear, the, the body of a leopard, had having iron teeth. And, and we see from that study the, the ancient Roman church was, was this church that is represented by this symbol that went about uh, destroying the saints, making the mortars of those who were followers of God, then we also saw this second beast come out of the earth. One beast coming out of the sea, where there's a, a place of population, a place of, of a lot of multitude of people. And then we see the second beast coming out of the earth, a place where there was a minor population, few people, people nonetheless, but a place that was not where all the other nations talked about in the Bible had come from. And we saw that this second beast was none other than the United States and, and, and that arises in Bible prophecy, having a key role of, of things that must shortly come to pass on the earth. And then as we, we, we come into chapter 14, we wonder who's going to be able to stand, who's going to be able to go through this crisis time. And we come to understand that God has his 144,000, not literal people, not a literal number of, uh, of a confined number of people, but this number is symbolically connected with these these uh, 144,000 Israelites, these people who are sealed with the seal of God. And we understand that these people are those, those who will be able to stand and go through that time of trouble through uh, the mark of the beast crisis. Then we went on into chapter 15 and 16, where we saw these seven angels having the seven last plagues, which will be poured out upon the earth after this crisis. We understand that these seven angels reveal to us the ministry that's going on in heaven. We see the the symbolic, the symbols that are there dealing with the sanctuary. And it helps us to understand what God is doing. And we came to understand, and our friends, I hope you got this. We came to understand that the plagues are not to be looked upon as terrifying if you are a follower of God, but as a promise and showing God's power that he is going to put an end to sin and he's going to put an end to death and, and to the things that sin has caused on this earth. So when we see those plagues, not that we should be running to the hills, but that we ask for protection. And God has said that he's going to provide us protection, but also to understand that because God is able to send these plagues and that he's promised to send them, then we can have assurance that he's going to bring everything to an end. So we get excited about the fact that the plagues will be coming down in Revelation 15 and 16. And now we come to Revelation chapter 17, where it brings us to an urgent message. It's a decision time has finally arrived. Everyone who wants to survive. must know to connect to the phone. Everyone who wants to survive must come out of Babylon, as we will see in Revelation 18. And so if you haven't done so already, now is the time to make your decision. Now is the time to make your calling election sure. Now is the time to, to decide that you want to follow Jesus all the way. And John states plainly in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive her plagues. And so there's a call of God's people to come out of Babylon. And so we're going to look at that tonight. You know, Babylon talks about being the, the great Babylon, comes into remembrance before the Lord, 
to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of the wrath of God. And so we see here that Revelation talks about this great city being divided into three parts, this great Babylon. And so we understand that there, there's these three parts to it. We have the beast, the, the, the dragon, and the false prophet, which makes up this Babylon. And so the Bible is very clear that it's talking of using the history of ancient Babylon to talk about modern spiritual Babylon, understanding that this is all centered about worship, all centered about who you worship and about how religion in the last days will be the centerpiece right before his soon coming. So as we move on into Revelation chapter 17 and verse one, the Bible says this says, and there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, come thither, and I will show thee, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk of the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away, John, carrying John away in the spirit into the wilderness, and John sees a woman sitting upon a scarlet covered beast, sitting upon a red beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and 10 horns, which we have seen already from the book of Revelation chapter 13, and, and understanding that this is that same beast that, that John is seeing here. And the Bible continues and says, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness, filthiness of fornication. And verse five, it says here, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So we're seeing this scene where John is seeing this woman sitting upon this scarlet covered beast. And he, she has in her hand, this wine, and she has on her, her head, her forehead, the name Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. So again, we want to recap. We want to understand what is a woman in Bible prophecy. There are several texts that point to this fact that a woman in Bible prophecy represents a church. We see here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, where Paul says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul is talking about the people of God. He is saying, I am presenting before you a as a chaste virgin. You are the symbolism of a pure woman to be presented to God. And so we understand that a church, a pure church especially, is represented by a woman in Bible prophecy. But the next question is, what is a beast in Bible prophecy? Well, the Bible lets us know in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, verse 17, uh, that the beast that Daniel saw in the vision that he was looking at, the beast, and this gets interpreted by Gabriel, lets us know that the beasts which are four are four kings or four kingdoms because kings represent kingdoms. Four kings which shall rise up out of the earth. So we understand that when we see beasts in Bible prophecy, that they represent a kingdom. And so we see from Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, the Bible calls this woman sitting upon the scarlet covered beast, calls this woman Mystery Babylon. Maybe her first name and last name, Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And so we discovered in previous lessons that Babylon is the name of an ancient empire. We can trace that back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 11 in particular, verses 1 through 9, where the Tower of Babel is described. This tower, this kind of tower, this, this ziggurat was built to house a special pagan shrine at its summit. And it was to reach up into the heavens because they were trying to, to get away from the flood. And the, the, the term Babel, it originally meant the gate of God. And so again, we see here that the tower that they were building was to take them into the heavens where they felt like they would be able to be with God. And so Babel was made a place of man-made worship, where people worship many different false gods along with the God of heaven. So if you remember the story, God told Noah that it was going to rain, that he was going to send a flood to destroy the earth. and so. 
as Noah preached for 120 years that the flood was going to come, he, he, he gathered together all the people that he could get into the ark, but they wouldn't listen. And so he preached to them and he preached to all these people for 120 years. And the only people that got into the ark was his family, his three sons, his three daughters-in-law and his wife and himself. So only eight people upon the ark. And, and, and as Noah was on the ark, God used Noah to repopulate the earth. And as, as, as Noah and his children multiplied, replenishing the earth, the people did not believe in the promise that God had made to them that he would never destroy the earth with a flood again. That's when we see the rainbow in the, in the sky. Understanding and knowing that God has made that promise that he would not destroy the earth again with a flood. But because of that, they didn't believe it. And so they began to build a tower, a tower which they called Babel, the gate to God, where they planned to be able to reach into the heaven to save themselves. Babel, the confusion, the gate of God, this was all pointed to people trying to save themselves. And so we see here that this tower was built up to, to the sky. And this is where God confused the languages of people. This is why we have all these different languages upon the earth. God confused the languages here at the Tower of Babel because he knew that mankind would continue to do more and more wickedness. And so uh, what is the symbol of Babylon in Revelation? It represents the Tower of Babel. It represents this great confusion. Babel or Babel, you know, we talk about babies babbling all the time. It sounds like confusion. Well, the word Babel, it means confusion. So this is a symbol of a mixture of religion, true, true religion and false religion, a mix of religious truth and false truth. And as I began to, to think about this, and I want you to understand that there are hundreds of religions on the earth, but there are major religions that are here on the earth. And I found this graphic here online where it talks about these major religions of the world. And we see here Christianity is at 31%. And I think it's a few years old because I think Islam is beginning to gain ground upon Christianity. But we see Christianity, Islam, uh, Judaism, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, those who are unaffiliated, even people who don't worship, worship something. And we understand here that there are all these religions in the world and that because of this, because of this, we have all these people with different languages. We have all these different religions. It has caused so much confusion upon the earth. How do we know which religion is the right religion? And if you say Christianity is the right religion, then we start looking at Christianity and understand that there's all kinds of different denominations, even in Christianity. And we have, Christ we have Catholicism, we have Protestantism. And I, and I hope you see here on the graphic here that evangelicalism is there. Evangelical, I mean, these are different words, but evangelical comes up. And so... We are, are now with this plethora of different religions that are here upon the earth. And we wonder, which one is God's true religion? We wonder which one is God's true religion. It seems like it's all Babel. But friends, I want to let you know that God does have a true people. God has a people who is following him upon this earth. They are his messengers to this world to prepare a people for his soon coming. And so as we are looking here, uh, we understand that this mystery Babylon, it points actually to the Roman Catholic Church. As we've seen in times past, as we've studied Revelation chapter 13 and 14, understanding that that beast in Revelation chapter 13 was pointing to a religious symbol. Religious symbol, understanding that it was Catholicism. It was confusion, Catholicism. And we understand that the second beast that comes out of the earth was pointing to apostate Protestantism. We find here that we have a combination of the church. We're seeing a closer and more focused view of this Catholicism that is there because it says that it, is, that it is mystery Babylon. But friends, I want you to understand that as we talk about Catholicism and the history of Catholicism, we want you to understand that the Bible is talking about a religious system and not just individual people. And so there are many wonderful believers that worship God in the Catholic Church. And friends, I was telling you about how you know, I used to have a girlfriend. She was a wonderful person, a devout Catholic, wonderful, loving person. There are people in the Catholic Church and all the various Protestant denominations that love God and they worship him and serve him sincerely. 
And so they're making a positive difference in the world in the name of Christ, in their community, in, in the places where they work, in the schools where they serve, all in the name of Jesus. But all Christians need to make a critical choice. They need to take a stand like John Huss. They need to take a stand like Martin Luther. They need to make a stand like hundreds of the reformers did years ago, where they're standing for truth no matter where it leads them. And so we understand that the Roman Catholic Church admits that they are that mystery Babylon. They are the, the mother of the uh, churches that we're going to talk about in just a moment. And so the Roman Church admits that they are, they, they, they admit that they, bring, they have brought in paganism and pagan philosophy into, uh, into Christianity. You know, the, the, there's a lot of quotes that we can go to, but I'm going to share just, just a few here pointing to how the Roman church admits that they are the ones who took paganism and they, they brought it into Christianity. Here in the Catholic world uh, uh, periodical, uh, page 58, back in 1894, I'm sorry, and it's on page eight, uh, 809, it says here that the church took the pagan philosophy and made it the buckler of faith against the heathen. So they took this, this, this pagan philosophy, and they use it against people to make it seem as if, this is the church doing this, to make it seem as if it was Christianity. It continues on and says, she took the pagan Roman pantheon, the temple of all the gods, these Roman gods, these Greek gods, and make it sacred to all the martyrs. So it stands to this day. When we talk about Peter and Athena and all these different Greek gods, they have now made this Zeus, we have now made it to be God the Father, and we have it being the Son, and we have it, you know, Athena or someone else being being the mother of Jesus. They took it all these things and, and made it sacred to the mortars. And then the Catholic Church took, she took Pagan Sunday and made it into the Christian Sunday. And that's why we have today many people in the world who are worshiping on the first day of the week when we all have studied the Word of God. And understand that the Sabbath is on the seventh day. God's day, his holy day, the Lord's day is on the seventh day of the week. And so this is where the change has come. This is where confusion has come into God's church. And then she also not only taking the day, she's also taking pagan Easter. You know, I, I tell you, friends, I don't know about you if you have children or have grown up thinking about this, about how Easter, how can Easter be associated with a bunny rabbit? and eggs. Never could understand it until I studied it for myself and understand that this pagan uh, celebration of Ishtar was baptized and brought into Christianity. And it was made the feast that we celebrate on during this season, uh, during the Easter season. And so we understand that the church has been intoxicated. The Roman church was intoxicated with false doctrines. And we understand that this is mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. And as I was studying this here and preparing this lesson, I ran across this graphic where I didn't know anything about this. These, these women, maybe you've seen them on the television show. I think they're showing up on Hulu, which I, I don't have that, but I've never seen the show. But this show is called The Harlots. This show is called The Harlots. So I was like, how could they have a show called The Harlots? But it really does bring up an important uh, mental picture here. Uh, this story, this show about the harlots is talking about this mother and her harlot daughters. Well, we're here now reading in the book of Revelation about mystery Babylon, the mother, and she's a mother of, of harlots. She can't be a mother unless she has children. And so mystery Babylon is a mother of harlots, meaning that there are religions that have, that have come out of Roman Catholicism that are now pointing their homage back to the mother religion. And so friends, we want to understand that mystery, the mystery Babylon is the mother and that she has daughters. And this is where we understand that there is confusion in the world, knowing that there's all these different Protestant denominations, whether it's Pentecostal or Protestant or Presbyterian or Evangelical or Baptist or Adventist or Methodist or Catholic, there's all these religions, and how do we know which one is God's true religion? And so, friends, we always have to remember that the Bible is talking about 
uh, religion and, and that God has always shown light on his people and is guiding them throughout the centuries back to his truth. And so as we see here on this graphic, we see we see the Walden Seas and, and how they brought the fact that the Bible and the Bible alone is what's the determining factor for our faith and belief and action. And so we saw John Huss bringing back the truth about how we must obey God rather than man. When I said Martin Luther talk, told us that, that grace, that we are saved by grace and saved by grace alone. And, and without it, we cannot be saved. We're not saved by the church. We're not saved by the pastor, but we're, that we are saved by grace. Calvin tells us that we must have spiritual growth, that we must live a life uh, that's pleasing to God and that we must grow in, in that faith that, we, that we've come to. The, the Baptist gave us, our, gave us baptism, pointing the church back to the truth that baptism is based upon immersion, that you get baptized by going into the water and then being bright, brought back out. It's not by sprinkling. It's not by salt. It's not by touching someone's head. It's all done by baptizing someone and putting them into water. The Westland told us that we must live holy lives. Holy, not, not, not lives where we're, we're going out drinking and smoking and doing all kind of debauchery, but that we must live the life that Christ lived, a life that exemplifies pureness, faithfulness, and truth. Uh, William Miller bringing a fact that the second coming is a true event that will come. As we understand that the first coming came when Jesus came, was born on a manger and that he died on the cross. He promised that he's going to come back and that the second coming is near. It is very near. Then we have the Advent movement where we come back to the truth about the Sabbath being the seventh day, not the first day, but the seventh day of the week that we must worship God in spirit and in truth on his Sabbath day. We came to understanding of, hell, of, of death, what happens when you die. We came to the, the fact and the truth about how God is concerned about our health. And so God has, has been continually bringing people back to his truth from all of that wit, that the, uh, the spiritual wickedness and confusion that has been brought about throughout the centuries. And the, but the Bible continues on. And we understand that this woman, Mystery Babylon, has these daughters. But the Bible also says that she is drunk with the blood of the saints. We see here where Mystery, Mystery Babylon, the symbol that's there, points to the fact, again, to the, the Catholic Church, as we see through the Dark Ages, where there were martyrs of the faith, those who stood firm for God, they were thrown into the lion's den, that they were, that they were beaten and they were burned at the stake, we understand that this woman was drunk of the blood of the saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when John saw her, he wondered with great admiration. Not that he was liking it, but he was astonished at the fact that this woman had done so much things. And so when we wonder what was she drunk of, she was drunk of the blood of the saints and the martyrs. Revelation chapter 17 continues. And it says here, I'm going to try to read this very quickly. It says that the angel said unto me, wherefore did you marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The angel tells him that the beast that you saw and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell upon the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. The Bible says here that there are seven kings. Five have fallen. One is and the other is, yet to, is not yet to come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Verse 11, it says here that the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth king and is of the seven and goes into perdition. When I read this every time, I'm like, wow, this sounds like a riddler for Batman. Holy riddles, Batman. How can we figure this thing out? Well, God, he doesn't let us read the Bible without understanding what is happening there in the Bible. And so we see here in Revelation chapter 17, verse 8, it pinpoints a time in history in which the prophet John is seeing events happening before him. He is seeing a future beast. We see this woman sitting upon a scarlet-covered beast. 
this is a beast that is future to him based upon the, the clues that we have here in the text. It says the people of the earth will marvel when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. And so this is a future beast that he is seeing. And, and, and they wonder what the seven heads represent. Well, John was told that the beast's heads represent seven mountains which are in which the woman sits. And so we know that this can't be a literal woman sitting on seven mountains at what time? At one time. I mean, that's that's not possible. These are not seven literal mountains. These are symbolic mountains. These are symbolic mountains. And so we see here that, that he also is told that that there are seven kings involved in this vision. Of these seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. And so the, the thing that we need to understand here that it has these 10 horns, which, which is on the beast. And so we understand that horns represents kings or kingdoms. We understand that heads represent kings and kingdoms. And they don't receive, they receive power as kings with one hour with the beast. And so it's a whole lot of confusion, but I want to try to make this very simple. The Bible in the book of Revelation in particular talks about several kingdoms. We see the symbolism shown in Revelation chapter 13, where we see this, 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 um, this beast coming out of the sea that, that has the head of a lion, that has the paws of a bear, that has the body of a leopard and has iron teeth. We remember seeing that when we study the book of Revelation, that that represents Babylon, um, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. But there's also another kingdom that is mentioned many times in the Bible and definitely mentioned here in the book of Revelation, and that is the kingdom of Egypt, the kingdom of Egypt, which, which enslaved God's people. And so when a lot of Bible scholars, and, and you know, there are many different Bible scholars that try to interpret this different ways, but they, they commonly interpret this, this first beast or this first set of five kings, which are fallen by the time that John is writing here or, be, or on the cusp of falling when we talk about Rome, um, that it represents uh, Egypt, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then it also could represent the sixth kingdom, which comes on, which we know in Revelation chapter 13, receives a deadly wound, which means that he was and is not. Number six, and then the seventh beast that John talks about is likely the beast that shows up in Revelation chapter 13, the one that comes out of the sea, the one that we understand to be the United States. And so this is this is one interpretation, and one I think this is probably the one that can stand most definitely with the Bible. We see these seven beasts, and the Bible talks about the beast that was and is not, that he is the eighth and is of the seven, uh, of the seven, and goes into perdition. So this is really telling us from this, this point in the book, this is a panorama of the rise and the fall of nations. God's laying out this sequence of world powers, and he shows us these details about the events that's going to proceed right before his second coming. And so in the description of Babylon's fall, God, again, he's summarizing the history of nations and the events uh, from the rise of ancient Babylon, rise of Egypt, ancient Babylon, and to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so we can discuss various interpretation and about specific words and phrases, but the fundamental issue is standing out very clearly. And this is this, that we need to focus on this thing here. Are we going to stay in Babylon or are we going to come out of Babylon? The Bible says that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And so all of the alliances that were created that, are, that have been coming up upon this earth, they have all been coming up against God. But, but friends, I want to encourage you to be on God's side, to come out of Babylon, to make sure that you stand for Jesus Christ and that you stand for him all the way. And so this is what we're seeing here in the book of Revelation, chapter 17. This chapter is talking about these rising of this nation. We see this mystery Babylon. We see this, this end time kingdom right before Jesus comes back that is there on the scenes. And we get the characteristics of it knowing that it's made up of a lot of different religions, a lot of different denominations. It is confusion in the religious world. And so we want to come out of confusion. And that's the key thing that we're going to find here in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1. The Bible continues that when John, after these things, he sees another angel come down from heaven, having great power, 
and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation uh, of, of devils and the hold of every foul spirit in the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So we see here in these first three verses, this angel comes down and says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, is fallen, and describes the fact that the, the nations have become drunk of her wine. And the merchants have, have paid homage to her and have waxed rich because of her de delicacies the things that she's been doing, the things that she's been given to the merchants because they have made their allegiance with Babylon. But the Bible continues in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, saying with another voice that John hears, come out of heaven, saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. And so this is a very important message. We read about the three angels' messages in Revelation chapter 14, where there was a call to worship God, to give glory to him because of the hour of his judgment has come, and that we should worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and the fountains of water. We see that the everlasting gospel is, is a gospel that calls us back to true worship, calls us back to worshiping on his Sabbath, calls us back to getting away from all the things that lead us astray, but to worship God and be faithful to him the everlasting gospel that we see in the book of Re book of Genesis all the way here in the book of Revelation, calling people back to worshiping him. But then the second angel talks about how Babylon is falling. Babylon is falling, which is very similar to this call here, that Babylon is falling. This, this church that once stood for God has now fallen into a, 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 a um, fallen into an area of, of confusion. Fall into an area of confusion, but then we read here in Revelation 13 about the third angel's message, which talks about the mark of the beast and not receiving the mark of the beast. Otherwise, you receive all of the wrath of God poured out without mixture. We see these three warnings, but here in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, there is this fourth angel, this fourth message telling God's people, it says my people, to come out of Babylon, to come out of confusion. And friends, I think this is one of those texts that I just love in the Bible, where it tells us that God has people in every church. God has people in all these different religions. God has people that are here that are atheists. God has people that he is trying to call out of confusion and that he is, he is talking to each one of us. The reason why we're here in this study right now is that we are learning what God ha has said in his word so that we can Help other people come out of confusion. This is a call here for each and every one of us to be disciples and that we learn the word of God and that we call people out of confusion, call people out of Babylon, because God says he has people that are in confusion. And so, friends, I want to implore you that as we read about this, this fourth angel's message, that this gospel is still being preached right now in this verse to come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. And so there's this call to come out of her. God is telling us uh, in his word that it's faithful and true, that it's a light shining upon a path. He also tells us that the book of Revelation, that the teachings of men have failed and that human religious systems will fail. It is our responsibility to come out of these churches, to come out of this confusion, to come out of these groups which distort the basic biblical teachings by mixing them with human doctrines. And this, friends, is, is the key to all of this. Understanding that um, a little bit of error mixed with truth is error. It will lead us, to us, lead us astray. And so, friends, we want to continue to study God's word that we may know uh, what he has in store for us and that we can call other people out of confusion call other people out of false doctrines, call other people out of false religions to come and to worship the true God. And not only that, to be ready for his soon coming, knowing that he is truly coming back. And we are seeing those signs unfolding before our very eyes. And again, I remind you, 
you know, those who may be listening to this le- later on, understanding that there is there is a war, a rumor of war that's happening. There's an actual war that has now just engaged right before our very eyes that we're seeing on television. So we know that God's word is true and that as things have been progressing year after year, century after century, wars have become worse and worse. And we're now seeing this devastation with our very eyes here. God is soon to come. And so, friends, we, we've got to be ready. And so the Bible tells us to come out of confusion, to come out of confusion. And, and we see here again, this, 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 we see two pieces of the, the threefold union of Babylon. We see the beast from the sea, uh, Catholicism, and, and, and her daughters. We also see with this beast number seven, we see apostate Protestantism. And friends, I don't know if we, I can't remember if we talked about this last time, but understand that Protestantism protests against the Catholic Church. That's the foundation of the word Protestantism. And so many of the Baptists and, and uh, Episcopalians and Presbyterians, uh, all these different uh, denominations that were calling out Catholicism for the errors that it was teaching and, and pushing upon the people as we saw in the graphic earlier in this in this study, we understand that this call to come out of confusion, this call to come out of error has been going on for centuries, but we still have confusion even today. And so friends, he is still calling us out of that confusion. Uh, Revelation chapter 18, verse five, lets us know that her sins have reached into heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. And, and, and it continues, and we're going we're gonna to wrap this up. Revelation chapter 18, verse 8, it tells us that, therefore her plague shall come in one day, death and mourning and famine. She shall be utterly destroyed with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. A mighty angel took up a stone like a, mill, a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and the musicians and the pipers and the trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman's of whatsoever craft he shall be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. In verse 24, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and, and of all that were slain upon the earth. So I'm going to end here. I'm going to end here where we see here the destruction of or the plagues falling upon Babylon. And so friends, again, I want to be very clear that God has people in Babylon. God has people in these churches. God has people in the various churches that he's calling out of confusion into his truth. And so once this call has been made, once all of his people have come out, once all of God's saints have been sealed, then we see the plagues fall. Then we see the crisis. Then we see all these things that are happening here. And so as we saw in Revelation chapter 18, this is just, just giving us that view in a symbolic way of the destruction and demise of confusion of Babylon the Great. And so they share in her sins, those people who continue to follow after confusion, those who continue to stay in the church because they have that choice, right? They share in her sins and they are cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years, for 10,000 10, years, for a thousand years. And they must be destroyed. They, they help destroy Babylon for within, uh, within to show their loyalty to God. And they shared her sins and received her plagues. This is from the lesson there. Um, so again, ending here on this last slide, that time is running out. We see from the, the, the progress from Revelation chapter 13, Revelation 13 and 14, showing us that there's gonna come this time of trouble, that there's gonna come this mark of the beast crisis and in 14, we understand that there are people who are going to be able to make it through that crisis, that 144,000 who are going to be sealed of God, who are going to be able to stand, and they're going to stand though the heavens fall. We see that God will carry them through that time. Chapter 15 and 16, we see that 
once these things happened that the plagues began to fall, not as a fearful thing for, for God's people, not for a fearful thing for us, but to know that God is wrapping up this business of sin. He's wrapping up and he's preparing to take his people home. And we see Revelation chapter 17, where God then focuses on Babylon. He focuses on those who continue to fight against him, those who are trying to destroy God's people. We see that he finally rains his plagues down on them in the destruction of, of Babylon. And, you know, and again, we talk about how the symbolism seems so gruesome. My kids tonight were reading from the book of Judges. It's like, wow, all these things that are happening in the book of Judges that, that we've even seeing on our screens right now, such destruction and death. It is a symbol and it's a reminder for how bad sin is and how we need to call people out of Babylon. It's all symbolism, friends, to call people out of Babylon because Babylon will be soon destroyed and that God is going to set up his kingdom. He's going to save his people and set up his kingdom that we may be with him forevermore. And so someday we will be able to enjoy face-to-face -face communion and, and, and companionship with God every day. There won't be any more forces of evil. There won't be any more sin. There won't be any more suffering. There won't be any more death and dying. There won't be any more crying, but that there will be peace and happiness forevermore. And I look for that time. I long for that time where there's peace and happiness. And, and, and so because these chapters give people this warning, it seems like it's such despair. But it's possible to be eternally lost by making the wrong decision. When we see a house that's on fire, we don't sit there and say, hey, you might need to come out your house. Hey, you might need to come out your house and just sit back and wait. No, what we do is we try to go in and save people. We call them, come out of the house. The house is on fire. Call the fire truck. Get everything. Get those people out. We, we, we go into response mode. We help people to get out of facing the wrong decision of staying in a burning house. The same thing here. We want to call people out of Babylon. We, under, we want to understand what confusion is and help people see the confusion that they're in and to call them out of, out of confusion. It's, a pos it's, impo it's possible to reject, to, to reject that forever friendship with God. And so we want, to call, we want people to see clearly those who are following him, those who have been faithful to him, those who are his people in Babylon, we want to call them out of Babylon so that he no will not receive the destruction that Babylon will receive. And so friends, I hope that you've got something out of this lesson. It's a powerful lesson. Wow. I mean, Revelation chapter 17 and 18, I go back and I read it every once in a while and I'm just like, wow, this is amazing. But all these things lead up to this end time where we just see the destruction of, of Babylon. And as we get closer to Revelation chapter 19, we see Jesus coming back as that great conqueror coming to take his people home. So may God bless you as you continue to study. And if you have any questions, please make sure you, you let us know whether you see it on, on, on the uh, YouTube page or if you uh, contact the Bible instructors, make sure that if you have questions, make sure you ask those questions. And so we want to close with a word of prayer and, and look forward to the next study. Let us pray. Dear Father God, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you, God, for what you have shown to us, these, these, these awesome pictures and symbols of what's about to happen. You showed us clearly who Mystery Babylon is. You showed us clearly that she has daughters. You showed us clearly that you do have a people that you are calling out of Babylon, people who, who worship you in truth, people who, who are faithful, people who, who forgive, people who, who love you and they, and they serve and they help people. But Lord, we know that you're trying to call them out of confusion. You're calling your lambs out of confusion. And so, Lord, we pray that you help us as we are studying, Lord, that we understand the truth, that we understand the truth that is in your word, that we will help people come out of confusion. And so, friend, so, so God, I ask that you be with those friends who have been studying with us, be with those who will, study, who will read this later, Lord, that you help each one of us come out of confusion and that we stay close with you and that we stay focused on your word, and that we continue to follow you wherever the lamb leads. Lord, bless us tonight. Bless those who are here online. Bless those who are, who are watching later. Lord, and bring us back together in the next appointed time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.